God's blessings and peace be with you now and always as you remember that He is the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Trinity who is in unity, our salvation. Amen. Today is a very special holiday in the church year. It's a day that we set aside that we talk about God. Now you might be saying to yourself, well, we, we're supposed to talk about God every week, or rather every day, right? But Holy Trinity Sunday is set aside so we specifically talk about who God is. So we talk about who God is in our world, in our lives, in our history. Now, there's oftentimes a trap that theologians, including myself, earlier this week, fall into. As I was wrestling with this text, as I was thinking about this sermon, I, as I struggled with it, my first thought was to make it a doctor, doctor, doctrinal dissertation. Easier said than done, I guess. But that's not what Holy Trinity Sunday is really about. Because in truth, explaining God to you is not what we are meant to do. In truth, as I preach this message, as I share it with you, it's not meant to give you a list of facts, things that you can file away for later. Besides, if I started throwing words at you like ontological trinity or imminent trinity, economic trinity, well, you guys didn't even write them down, so I'm thinking you're not going to pick those up. But in truth, well, it's important that we maybe know those words. It's more important that we know that those words simply try to explain the Trinity. They simply try to explain God. And we can't do that. We can't explain God. It is impossible. No matter how many books you read, no matter how many theologians you sit at the feet of, we can't explain Him. He is beyond us, above us, and with us. Now we try to explain God. It's true, we, we try to come up with all kinds of different images, simple or great, to explain who he is. One of my favorites is trying to explain God by H2O, two hydrogens, one oxygen, simple water. If you remember back to your seventh grade science classes, you remember that matter has three basic forms, solid, liquid, and gas. Sound familiar at least, ringing a few bells. I know some of those bells are a long time ago. But... Some people explain the Trinity by saying that, well, God is like water. And sometimes, and he takes on different forms. Just like water, sometimes, it's, when it's a liquid, you can drink it. When it's a solid, it's frozen and it cools your drink. When it's, a, when it's steam, it's on the mirror in your bathroom this morning. But that's not really a true image of God. See, it, it falls, and that's what happens with most of these explanations of God. It's what's called modalism, actually, and not that, again, that you need to write this word down, but modalism basically says that, that God just is all, always exactly the same, but he just changes. It just changes. And maybe explain it this way. At the, at the creation, we had God the Father, and he put on that mask, and he did the creative thing. But then, oh, wait, we need a Redeemer. So he pulled out his Redeemer mask, and he put on his Redeemer mask, and we have God the Son. Then he pulled out his Holy Spirit mask, and he put on his Holy Spirit mask. But that's not who God is. God is Trinity. He is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He is not one who changes. He's not uh, constantly switching. But He is always God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. There's another one I like a lot, and you may, you know, back to that uh, Midwestern accent, but uh, the example of an ag, and go ahead, if you didn't understand me, that's the thing you put in your frying pan. The, but anyhow, the, the, a lot of people try to use that as an example of the Trinity. They say, well, you have the shell, you have the white and you have the yolk. See, it's three parts, one substance. Except it's not one substance, is it? When you think about an egg, yes, it comes from the same source, but the yolk, the shell, the white are all three different things. This actually falls into what's called tritheism. Or in other words, trying to explain God by saying, well, it's just three different gods. Now, none of us would say that we are. We're monotheists, right? But God is not like or the Father is not like the Son. The Son is not like the Holy Spirit. The this, this Holy Spirit is not like the Father. They are one and one substance. We confess that every week in the Nicene Creed, they were very explicit when they wrote that creed, so that we would say, it is not like one another, but they are. Oh boy, we're still running into problems explaining God, aren't we? Well, there's another one that comes up, subordinationism, and this is one that we see pretty often around us. Subordinationism is this idea that Jesus and the Holy Spirit, they're god light. The Father created them. That they're not quite full God because they're what the fancy word is demigods, but that's okay if you don't know that word either. But what we're talking about there is saying that, well, the Father created them at the beginning. That's what and the, the, those who believe this heresy say, well, okay, 
Well, we can't explain how Jesus was man and God. So we'll just say that God created him to fill those shoes and to take that place. But there's a big problem there, isn't it? Well, the big problem is, is if Jesus is not God, remember, not like, not almost, if he's not God, he can't be our salvation. He cannot be the one who goes to the cross for you. He cannot be the one who goes to the cross for me. Because if he is like God, well, then we can only have like salvation, and that's no salvation. There's one last one, and that's, that's one that comes up a lot of times in the way that we speak. Now, I don't think any of you all are Unitarians. Perhaps you've heard of the Unitarians. They have similar ideas to those who are modalists, believing that God just takes different forms, but they actually really throw out the Father and the Spirit. And they talk about just Jesus and how important it is just Jesus. On the one hand, our salvation is based on Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. And that is absolutely true. There is no other f salvation under heaven but on the other hand, it is not just Jesus. And we do not truly know Jesus if all we say, well, I believe in Jesus, so I'm saved. But when we talk about that belief, we are talking about believing in the Christ who is in Scripture, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And like I said, many of us, sometimes we get into that habit of saying, well, as long as I believe in Jesus, as long as I believe... No. No, no, no. We need to believe in God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And even if we do not understand. And I think that's where we should go. Instead of trying to explain God, using fancy little ideas and, and images, we are meant to celebrate Him. Just look at the words of the psalmist for today. Like I said, Psalm chapter 8. Read it again. Read it every morning if you have a chance. But in that psalm, the, psalm doesn't try to, the psalmist doesn't try to answer the, all of his questions. He just says, Oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. He knew that there was no possible answer that any man could give. He knew that there was no answer that he himself could live. But he knew that the Lord was majestic and powerful and almighty and amazing. And I think it's important for us for a moment to just take a, th take a moment to think about what it means that our Lord is majestic. What it means that He is amazing. That He is awesome. And I don't mean awesome like a new pair of shoes or a new haircut. I'm talking awesome in the sense that it fills your heart and overwhelms you in a way that you can't even explain. And when you think of God, that's what should be happening. Because God, He is beyond our creation. He's created you. He's created our world. He's created our universe. Simple words from his lips. He is beyond time. He's outside of time. He can't be measured by a day or a week or an hour or even a thousand years. He's outside of our power. Outside of our majesty. Our scales could never even equivocate. But most amazing to me is, is his love. That His love is so amazing. His love for you and for me, it is immeasurable. Just think about the next words the psalmist says right after he goes through all the things God has done. He says, who is man that you are mindful of him? Who are we? And yet God remembers each one of us. He knows our intimate details of our lives. He knows the very count of hairs on your head. And he's almighty. Isn't that amazing? Do you know that our God, He loves you enough and cares for you enough that, that He takes the time to know you, to know you in ways that even your spouse couldn't know you? On the other hand, it's a scary thought, isn't it? It's a scary thought to think about the fact that God knows us so well. It's a scary thought because it means that there is nothing outside of His vision, outside of His image. There is nothing that He is blind from. In fact, he sees every sin we commit, whether we do so in thought, word, or deed. He sees everything that we do. The good and the bad. Who is man that God is mindful of us? Well, when we start to look at that question, it's a pretty hideous picture, to be honest with you. And I don't think hideous is too strong a word. Because when we look at ourselves, when we look at our hearts... How many of us could say that we have followed God's to man to worship Him, to praise Him, to trust in Him and love Him above all else? Not one of us. 
How many of us could say that we have kept the first commandment perfectly? If you go back to Exodus, it's a very simple command, a few short words. You shall have no other gods. Seems simple enough, and yet how many times do we have other gods? How many times do we put other things before us? How many times do we love and obey others and other things before Him? How many times do we trust ourselves and trust the ways of the world instead of trusting in Him? Jesus he kind of clarify, clarifies that a little bit for us. and He says that we are to love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our mind, with all our soul, with all our strength. How many of us can say we do that? No, not one of us. And the problem is it's not just our relationship with God that suffers. And it's not just our relationship with Him. But when we can't keep the first commandment, well, we certainly can't keep the second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, or tenth, or six hundred thirteenth. In truth, it's a pretty hideous picture when we look at our sinful selves, our ugly selves, our rotten selves. Because we are poor, miserable sinners. We are those who call God magnificent, but question Him at every turn. We are those who call God wonderful and amazing and all-powerful and demand from Him answers for why things are the way they are in our world. Why does my son have cancer? He's not a bad kid. He's dieted. He's you know, listened to the doctors. Why does my daughter, why is she a, a double amputee now? After an IED hit her Humvee, she was a good Christian girl. Why do I have struggles in my relationship with my wife, with, with my husband? Why do, I, why do we struggle with these relationships? Aren't we Christian people? Why do we struggle with our relationship with those around us, our neighbors? Seemingly to constantly pick fights, to bicker, to blame. How often do we ask God, Lord, why this tragedy? Why that tragedy? How could you have allowed this? Is not everything in your, the palm of your hand? We look at tragedies like Oklahoma or Newtown and we see these seemingly innocent children dying. Not to mention the 3,000 will be put to death before they take their first breath today, tomorrow, and every day for the, ne for the foreseeable future. And how easy it is for us to ask God why. How easy it is for us to question Him. And how hard it is for us to celebrate His awesome power and His amazing love. It sure is hard, isn't it? It sure is difficult because here we sit and here we, we confess Him and we, and we pray to Him, but we feel like our answers aren't, that we're not receiving answers to our questions or if our questions are even heard. Well, the psalmist gives us another answer. Several psalms later in Psalm chapter 46, Be still and know that I'm God. Be still and know that I'm God. Now notice it's not just be still. Be quiet. Leave me alone. I've got more important things to do running a universe here. Be still and know that I am God. That He is God and He is in control. And while we don't understand everything, that He is still in control. And that He is the one who changed human history for your sake. For your sake, God changed human history. It wasn't for the sinner sitting next to you. It wasn't for the sinner outside down the street. It wasn't for the sinner down the street at the other church. He changed human history for you. He sent His Son to die on the cross. And that is His ridiculously amazing love. Because no one would, would give their life. No one would give their life for a wicked man. But God would. For you, He gave His life. For you, He changed the path of death and sin and hell so that you might have eternal life for you and for me, for each one of us. And that right there is truly amazing. Because that right there is something that not one of us would do. Not one of us could even imagine doing. Not one of us could even start to do. But He did it. Despite the fact that we were who we were. Despite the sinners we were. Instead, He said, I love you. And with those words, He bore your sins and He bore your shame. 
with those words, he did what was ridiculous and what was unexpected. With those words, he changed the world forever. And if those words aren't amazing to you, you need a heart check. No, I don't mean go to your cardiologist today. I don't mean run out there and make sure that you've got everything's going right and beaten on the right path. But if those words aren't amazing to you, if they don't give you pause for just a moment, that God, Almighty God, the majestic God of the universe loves you, then you need to pause and you need to check your heart and you need to say to yourself, Oh Lord, have mercy on me. Lord, rekindle in me your love and your spirit. Lord, ignite that lives within us and His love is made complete in us. We know that we live in Him and He in us because He has given us His Spirit. And we have seen and we testify that the Father has sent His Son to be the Savior of the world. Our lives, they are meant to testify to Christ. Our lives, they are meant to be made complete with His love. Our lives are not meant to explain God. They're not meant to, t to list a bunch of facts about God. But to share our faith, it's pretty simple, folks. Show people your sins. Show people how wicked you are. But show them how much God loves you. Show people how much God loves you. How much He sacrificed for you. And that's going to be better than any explanation ever could give. That you could give. That's better than any answer that we could imagine or dream up. Because it reminds us that our God is amazing, that He loves us, and that we might say with the psalmist, O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is Your name in all the earth. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we give thanks to You that You have given your life for us on the cross, that you have sacrificed yourself, that you have been the one to take our place. And we thank you that although we don't understand this, that you have shown us this gracious love. Lord, please forgive us for those times when we try to put you in a box, when we try to make you fit into our, between our ears that we might understand you. Forgive us for those times when we strip you of your power and we strip you of, uh, of all the, uh, the glory you are deserving. Forgive us for those times when we give up our trust in You and we turn, over to the, turn it over to the world. Forgive us for those times and let us, Lord, again, check our hearts with You that we might again experience the truth that You are with us, that You do love us, that Your Holy Spirit is still working among us. May this be the promise that we hold to. May this be the promise that leads us and may this be the promise that gives us hope that one day we might join You for all eternity. This we pray through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with the Father and the Holy Spirit, the Holy Trinity, one God in Trinity, one God in unity. Amen.